the things that I have been pursuing is all outside of me. I've always prided myself of being a goal-oriented, driven person. But during those ten days where you do nothing but meditation, I had so much time, and then I just realized it was basically the money, the fame, the recognition that I was looking for, and. The more you want this, the harder it drives you to certain position. Yes, but at a certain point, it also created so much pain for yourself. So that realization was really important because then I have to think: if you don't have inner peace, if there's no way you can create value for other people. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Essence of Investing, where we explore the stories, strategies, wit, and wisdom of investors from across the Asia region and beyond. I'm your host, Jonathan Reckman. My guest today is the one and only Nicole Su, founder and managing director of Jade House Capital, and a career-long specialist in secondaries. In this episode, we dive deep into Nicole's story, her strategy for negotiating deals, the role of ego, mindfulness, and emotion in the finance industry, and finally. Through a live on-air meditation, we uncover the deeper existential meaning of private market secondaries. We were lucky enough to record this conversation live at the Honest Drink Podcast Studio in Shanghai. Please listen, share, give feedback, and most of all, enjoy. The essence of investing is powered by Next Level Communication and by the world of allocators. Next Level Communication helps investors and multinational executives in Asia tell their stories to their most important global stakeholders. Get in touch at reachnextlevel.net to learn more about cross-border IR, strategic communication, and presentation training services. The world of allocators encourages long-term thinking and the adoption of the endowment approach among asset managers in China. Get in touch to join our. Our community of domestic and overseas practitioners to share and learn. You're a secondary specialist.、Yeah. What are secondaries,、mm. and what does it take to be a specialist in them?、Mm. So, a lot of people, a lot of people mistake secondaries as public equity because actually in Chinese they're very similar.、Um, but secondaries here specifically refers to Buy and sell assets in the private equity market, and because private equity market is a closed end uh, uh, product, so once you commit it, let's say, it probably will take you about ten years, sometimes even more, to officially get out. But of course, within the course of ten years, things can happen, right? So even you are a very big institutional investor, things could happen that you will have to exit your positions. And therefore, there's secondary market for that. So, so it's sort、yeah. of like a life happens, right? Like you you go in with a you know an institution might go in with a strategy and say we're going to you know be long term holders. We're we're comfortable with illiquidity in this. This is part of our strategy, but then something changes. What、right. what typically、right. changes? What are the most common motivators for LPs in this case institutional holders to change their mind and say we、mm-hmm. we got to get、yeah. rid of these. Um, I think there are a couple of key drivers for that decision to sell. One of the biggest happened in the history was basically right after the global financial crisis, and after global financial crisis happened, basically U.S. pushed for the Fokker Rule to take place, and that basically said all the banks have to significantly reduce their exposure to private equity and hedge funds. So these banks are actually very big players in private equity. So they not only they have their own private equity team, so in the so-called principal team, and they also invest a lot in the external managers, so in the funds. So now they have to sell billions and billions of portfolios as well as their own、uh, direct investment on their books. So that created a surge、uh, in the secondary market. So be- of course, overall secondary market happened, I think around. Uh, late 90s, early 2000s, but activities are quite ad hoc.、Um, people start to build their portfolios and then start to buy uh, uh, portfolios. But I think it was the GFC that really pushed the secondary market to a new high. Yeah. And that was because a government fiat 
decreed that they need a higher level of liquidity. And so it, it forced them to let go of these illiquid assets and created it or, or added fuel to the secondary market. Fast forward 10 or 15 years, uh, what is fueling the interest in secondaries today? The regulatory regulatory changes is one of the force in the history of the secondary market. And the other thing is, once people have understand the secondary more and more, um, LPs, especially pension funds, endowments, those sophisticated LPs are actually using secondary markets to rebalance their portfolios from time to time. Uh, for example, maybe in year one, they invested a lot in emerging markets. Maybe in year three, they said, I'm going to trim down in, on my exposure into emerging markets. Or let's say, for example, within uh, Asia Pacific, their previous strategy could be they invest in uh, pan-Asia funds. But then they said, OK, going forward, I'm going to invest in country fund and specialist funds. So I'm going to trim down because of obviously the money that they get is not free flow, right? So they also have to recycle their capital. So in a way, they use secondary markets to recycle that capital and rebalance their portfolio. So secondary has, in a way, has become a rebalancing tool for those LPs. So that is um, also a, a huge drive for the secondary uh, transaction volumes. And then the third thing is, of course, the liquidities. From time to time, especially when the economy is not great, from time to time, their corporates, high net worth individuals, or sometimes family offices, they have liquidity issues, or they would like to have more liquidities to help their main business uh, so that they are looking to sell. So that is also an, another key driver to the volume as well. How much of secondary transactions are done at a markup versus a markdown? Let's, let's first define the definition of um, the price, OK? Um, usually, the private equity is marked to mark to market, and the market. Let's say all these portfolios are uh, private companies, so they are not listed. So there is no public price for these. So the private price for these are basically the latest uh, round for the fundraising, and these are so-called um, fair price. Uh, most of the managers would mark their portfolios according to the latest round of the valuation. And if we are talking about price, so typically you are either priced above the NAV, so net asset value NAV, at NAV. If it's above the NAV, then it's a premium, right? If it's at NAV, then it's at par. And then if it's below NAV, then it's discount. And in the past, I would say 20 years or so, most, most, most of the assets are priced at discount. And I think, of course, that is one of the key attraction to a lot of the investors that invest in secondary products, because you can take advantage of the situation where the seller has to sell. And you are basically buying at the time that they have left behind. But of course, there are cases where you buy at premium and there are cases where you buy at par. It all depends on the quality of the assets. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're seeing right now, you described a lot of it as, as kind of trimming and sounds very strategic and you know, we're, we're moving from regional to country funds. Is there also some amount of people want um, to hedge their geopolitical exposure or um, you know, other, other factors that are causing them to, to consider selling at a, at a deep discount? Right. I think this is quite um, a new phenomenon, especially in the past two years or so. Um, as you know, that the relationship between U.S. and China is really tensing up. So quite a lot of U.S. investors are pulling out of uh, China market. So by saying pulling out, I think foremost means that they stop investing. So basically, they stop committing new monies into China. But some of them are actually selling some exposures as well. I hear a lot of Chinese GPs, you know, under pressure now to explain how they're going to get liquidity and, and achieve DPI. And when, all, you know, the stock markets are seem very inaccessible. And almost all of them say, well, our top choice is still to list our second, you know, choice might be a, a trade sale or M and A, uh, but we will also consider secondaries. Yeah. And it's always talked about as sort of a 
option of last resort. Um, how do you position this when you talk to GPs and you want to see if they're interested in selling or, um, or, or LPs that are, are thinking about selling their stakes? How do you talk to them? What, what is the, how do the discussions go? How do you motivate them to sell or make them comfortable selling at a discount, make them, you know, there's quite a bit of psychology, I imagine, mm -hmm. also, and just getting people comfortable, both personally and institutionally, getting comfortable with taking these discounts. What are those conversations like? Mm, yeah, maybe I will go a little bit back to your early comments on the last resort. Because secondaries nowadays, maybe 20 years ago, secondary is the last resort. Um, I almost feel like when I joined the whole industry, I feel like it is actually quite hard to talk to the GPs and talk to the LPs that you, you, you approach them and then you say, hey, um, do you have anything to sell or do you want to sell? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here to buy, right? They sort of push you away. But I would say um, after 20 years of fast development, uh, secondary is definitely not last mm -hmm. resort, especially to GPs. So in the past, uh, I would say probably five years or so, the the so-called GP-led transaction have taken up 50% of the total transactions. By GP-led, I'm saying, so the GP is actively using secondary markets to their own benefits. For example, liquidate their portfolios. For example, to raise new funds, which is very important for the GPs, right? But I, I totally... You know, I agree with you. I think there is a psychology play in this kind of transactions. And that is exactly why I always liked secondaries. And I've been in this, second, uh, in this industry for now 13 years. My first 10 years was as a buyer. And then my last three years was in, as an advisory. So you, um, my role has changed, right, from buyer's role to the advisory's role. But I think the element I like about secondaries was the element, at least at the beginning of my career, I think it was at, uh, the element um, was the negotiating part. And for me, it was like, I, I, was, I think I was a quite a competitive person, right? So I like to negotiate and I like to win. Well, I, I would call it, if you, if you successfully negotiate a deal, it was like a win to me. That was my early years. And now since I, you know, changed my, my role and I feel like it is more important to make the pie bigger so that we can both win. And this is very important for me to realize actually now, no matter whether I am a buyer or no matter whether I am an advisory or actually this I think it goes outside of the secondary market as well, is that you have to create a win-win situation. And maybe once in, a, once in a big while, you can take advantage of someone in some situations. But I think in general in life, you cannot do that. You have to create a win-win situation so that everybody walk away with something that they wanted. How do you make the pie bigger when markets are so difficult, when valuations are going down, mm -hmm. when, you know, liquidity is really tight. Yeah. How do you make more for people when it seems like there's less? Right. Let's say there is definitely not just about price. So obviously price is the most important thing to the seller when the seller is, you know, is on the market to sell. But there are other um, metrics that they could potentially value, for example, the speed of the transaction, the, uh, uh, the discretion of the whole transaction. Sometimes you can balance price versus the payment structures so that you find these little bit of leeways here and there. So it is really important to understand. I mean, of course, you know, when you approach seller, uh, they will tell you, I want this thing to be at this price. Um, but then it takes time for you to talk to them, understand them, and then it takes time for them to warm up to you and tell you, oh, what's really happening? And other than price, what are the other things that they are looking for or they value? And then, then you said, okay, instead of you know providing you this price, which is, for example, 
not possible in the in this market, right? Are there any things we can structure to help you to get a better result? I can feel your enthusiasm when you talk about the negotiation, when you talk about、mm-hmm. you know the price and the terms and all the different factors that go into to reaching one of these deals. What do you love about secondaries, and why have you devoted your career to it? What makes you a good secondary specialist? What are the requisite skills and requisite mindsets that you would need in doing secondaries that maybe other investors, you know, who also have to negotiate terms and stuff? But what what makes this unique? So what I like about secondaries, to just just to start from my perspective, is the sourcing part and the negotiating part. Um, the sourcing part, I remember when I was an、um, associate, I would go with my senior,、um, meet, visiting multiple LPs, multiple GPs, and tell them what we do and understand, you know, their situation, and then sometimes maybe offer uh, uh, some of our successful case studies, so that they could see whether our approach would make sense to them. So I feel like this is a great exercise for me when I was very young because I actually liked the interaction part with people.、Um, I think being at secondary firm and slash at a fund of funds firm when I was quite young, it was great experience for me to talk to people way senior than me. I, I think if you interview anybody from a fund of funds position, they will probably that tell you that this is probably one of the biggest benefits. So I liked that. Interaction part. Try to understand what people needs and how we can, you know, be their partner. And then, of course, the negotiating part that I already mentioned before. I think the due diligence part is probably more or less the same as every other investors. But I think the key difference is so secondaries. Typically, you buy a portfolio of many many companies. Sometimes we、uh, would price a deal. And the deal would have a portfolio of like 50 companies, 100 companies, and then basically you are doing modelings,、uh, like day and night, maybe 10 companies a day. So th- this is、uh, so before I joined a、uh, secondary fund, I was working at a consulting firm, and、uh, we would take it would take us three months to look at one company, very detailed, right? And now when I switch job from that consulting firm to the secondary fund, all of a sudden I'm looking at 30 companies in one week, figurative speaking, and that change of mindset is huge. But it's very interesting because it's not just how you actually do due diligence, and you still make sure that even you spend, I don't know,、uh, half day on a company, you could still more or less reach to a reasonable conclusion. So, other than that, I think the key point is you need to have a portfolio view. So when I was、uh, looking at a company for three months, you look at so many details. And you can imagine yourself buried into the deep ground. Whereas I remember when I joined second, the secondary fund, not long after I joined, my、uh, my boss told me sometimes you need to step back and then look at things at a more higher level. And that actually I think about that all the time because it is important for you. Uh, not only at modeling a portfolio, but also especially when when I'm more at a management role later on during my career, and and now especially as a, as a co-founder of a business, I think that perspective was really、uh, empowering, and then that's that's why I still think of that. So 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 that change of mindset was really interesting、uh, from a secondary perspective. That's probably quite unique. How do you zoom out and get that macro perspective? What Kind of whether from a technical, professional perspective or from like a personal practice, how do you look at things in a bigger picture? This is an interesting question because <laughs> because in my mind I'm just thinking that I will step back, right?、Um, I I think it's just looking at the picture at a far away perspective. So it is like.、Um, Let me let me first say on a technical level, when you do due diligence on the portfolio, of course you still look at 
you know, market trends, look at top line growth, look at margins, look at exit multiples that you could apply. But then if you step back and then look at portfolio level, you then you can see how correlated are these underlying companies? Are they in the same industry? Are they in the same country? Are they more or less impacted by similar regulatory changes? And you came out to that level that was already a step back. And then I think also important for the fund managers is this portfolio, how correlated is this portfolio with your other portfolios that you've already invested? Does it make sense to add more or does it make sense to not add more with this kind of stuff? Or if you want to add more at what price, right? So that's a, a technical perspective to, to answer your question. Um, but also I think more, you know, from a life perspective, I, it reminds me of how we do meditation. When you do meditation, you basically let yourself, let your mind sit far away from everything else that happens in your mind. Right. And then, and then you say, okay, this thought happened, let it be. And then, and then this thought just, you know, slipped away, right? And then you'll be like, ah, okay. So you don't have to be so involved. You don't have to be so, uh, you know, so engrossed into details sometimes. So that's also quite magic because mm -hmm. you do need to focus on details from time to time. And to be honest, I actually think detail oriented is a, such a merit for, for, for people in our industry. But on the other hand, you just have to, you know, step out and then think on a bigger picture. Yeah. This is the, I mean, this is the core metaphor that I think drives so much of my, my interest in this podcast is that finance is one of the best metaphors for transcendental existentialism in its focus on taking really micro little bits, right? If, if we were to just like build from the very bottom up, it's customers engaging in transactions which create, you know, bundles together to create cash flows, which bundles together to create a portfolio of cash flows, which then you combine with other portfolios and you have, a, you know, a portfolio of portfolios and, you know, thus a fund and then a fund of funds. And, and you can just keep going out. Yeah. And at each level is, there's so much to explore. It's sort of like a, a fractal. You can, you can open up the box at any of these dimensions and there are, endless things to do due diligence on or to research or examine and to question at any of these levels. And just like in life, you know, we could look at the texture of this table or we could look at the form of the table or we could look at the position of the table in this room or we could look at this room in this neighborhood or we could look at the neighborhood in position of the city or the city and the earth and then all the way out to the cosmos. And the ability to transcend between these different levels and dimensions intellectually in finance or existentially as human beings is just the coolest skill. So when you talk about meditation and, you know, your relationship with a thought, you know, we can think of a thought as a unit similar to, you know, a cash flow or something. <laughs> and then you can kind of like zoom in closer to that thought yeah. and really get into the, you know, to, to the, to the nuts and bolts of a thought, or you can step way back from the thought and just just hold it or let it go it's a beautiful thing you meditate i do yeah and and the more i do the more more depth on the micro and the macro you find yeah and i i'm always looking for these parallels mm. where what our spiritual or, you know, meditative practice, how does that connect to our business or finance practice? Mm. And what have you learned from your career in secondaries that teaches you something about meditation or about being and maybe vice versa? You know, if you meditate or you have some spiritual practice, mm. what does that teach you about investing? Yeah, I want to... I want to share how I got into meditation. Um, I think many, many years ago, I read a book called 10% Heavier. 
Uh, I'm not sure if you read this book. This book was written by a CBC anchor. Had went to Pakistan and had, you know, PTSD after he came back to the U.S. Anyways, I I, I won't give too much details on the book because、um, I would recommend everybody to read it. Um, in this book, he mentioned Vipassana. He went to Vipassana, and then the ten percent happier happened. Basically,、um, I was quite fascinated by the idea of Vipassana. There was a point in my career life I really felt that I've hit the bottleneck, or I've hit the plateau, and I don't know what to do. I was really struggling, so I thought to myself. Hey, I'm gonna take ten days off, no matter what. I'm gonna do this vipassana thing, and then so I did. I remember, I booked because vipassana you had to you had to book quite in advance. I remember that the week the ten days that I was away, there was a, a deal that we were supposed to go to group IC, and I was like, you know. My deal team can handle it. I will just go as planned. In those ten days, I think miracle happened to me. What was the miracle? The miracle was that I realized the things that I have been pursuing is all outside of me. So, as I was saying, I. Think I am quite a competitive person, and our generation was raised as you have to be good at this, you have to be better at this than the other person, and you have to, you know, you have to be a goal getter. And then I've always, you know, before before the the realization, right? I've always prided myself of being a goal oriented. Driven person, but during those ten days where you do nothing but meditation, I had so much time, and then I just realized it was basically the money, the fame, the recognition that I was looking for. And the more you want this, the harder it drives you to certain position. Yes. I mean, I was. I I think, of course, I was fortunate to get where I was, right? Because how I was. But at a certain point, it also created so much pain for yourself. So that realization was really important because then I have to think, what was the passion? Ah,、uh, do I do it because of these external things, or do I do it because I truly want to? Let's say, for example. Create value for the society, or create value for certain people, or create peace within myself. And I think the, probably the least part is the most important for me, right? Because if you don't have inner peace, it, there's no way you can create value for other people. After I came back from the meditation,、um, the vipassana experience, I feel that I'm a little bit more balanced. I was pushing myself really hard for maybe ten years, yeah, ten years, and at a point I need to rebalance a little bit, and I think so. Ever ever since that uh, experience, uh, that was in two thousand nineteen when I went to Vipassana,、um, I start to practice meditation. Almost on a daily basis. Sometimes I had to I had to skip, but almost on a daily basis. And it's just those twenty minutes every day that, at least you are just with yourself, and then it keeps me in check at least. So I think that realization was was very important. Yeah. So and you ask me how does meditation changed my investing career? I think it's just changed my my entire. Like career path, and right after the meditation, I decided that I'm gonna move from my previous employer to to now to basically starting my own business. What did you want to bring with you from your career previously into your new venture, and what did you want to let go of? 
I used to work for a, a quite big company. Once I switched from working for a very big company to starting、um, on my own, certain things naturally went away. Not necessarily that I let go, but certain things like reporting, like certain processes, like bu bureaucracy,、uh, that definitely went away. And I truly、uh, enjoying that sort of transition. Also, I think what also went away was the the quote unquote aura because you used to work for a big company.、Um, people more or less respect、uh, again quote unquote respect you, and you feel you know you go anywhere you request for a meeting and people were just nice to you right. And now that you sort of on your own. I would think that is the biggest、uh, gain from switching job to job is because again those those aura are not yours. They are they belongs to that brand, that platform. And right now, we do everything on ourselves, and every achievement was truly a reflection. Of our capabilities to help our clients. Of course, sometimes it's difficult, especially the market is is tough. But still, little by little, bit by bit,、uh, we're doing things. We're moving forward, and that's really what I'm really proud of. And I, I, I mean, I encourage all my friends around me who had the. Impulse to do business on their own. I encourage them to do it, but of course, the market now is is tough for everybody to to start a business now. But I think because doing things on your own or uh, uh, starting a business on your own, it's a such change in your mindset, and then it's a such change to you as a person, and and that lesson is very valuable. Even the business. Let's say even the business fails one day, doesn't matter because you you are changed as a person. I, I'm 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 sure you also have same reflection because you are also a business owner. Yeah, I mean、yeah. the only difference is I've never had a job, so I I don't know what the aura <laughs> of having a, a big institutional credibility. I've been、yeah. kind of hacking it on my、yeah. own my entire career,、um, but I I definitely know that that sense of of having to find your own path and in the process finding. Parts of yourself. What do you want to experience that you haven't yet experienced on this journey? So when I left、uh, my secondary fund company, so my my boss was quite angry with me in a way.、Uh, so we didn't talk for I think seven or eight years, and I went back to the Netherlands last year to visit him. He said, "Oh, I always knew you're gonna start your own business." But then he asked me, he said, "When are you going to start your own fund?" So it's weird because sometimes people say something and then it's it's kind of like planted a seed in you, right? So obviously I've been on the buy side for ten years and now I'm doing my own business, but it's not a fund business, and I still feel. That it could be something that I would really wanted to do, and again, doing a fund business is not just investing. Doing a fund business is also starting a business, and then you have to take care of your LPs, and you have to take care of your relationships and your underlying companies and that kind of stuff, right?、Um, that could be my career. So I I think that could be the 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 next or the last thing that I want to do in my investment career, and for my personal life, you know I started studying psychology a couple of years ago, and I would really like to be a counselor, and I would really like to be able to help people、um, on that front. And the good thing about investor and psychological counselor is, the older you are, the better. Hopefully, the better you are. So I'm quite looking forward to that. Yeah, I think maybe we can meditate for one minute. I love it. That's a great idea. That's spectacular.
Anything come to mind? I just had a nice thought that secondaries are really about letting go. Oh, interesting. How so? Explain. It's sort of the finance of detachment. It's the idea that we carry things with us in our、uh. portfolios that maybe aren't serving us the way we want them to, and they're valuable. But we let them go,、mm-hmm. and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we、mm. pay a price for it,、mm. or the things aren't what we thought they would be. Yeah, but we let them go, and in doing so, maybe we actually create value for others. We find those things aren't worthless. They're not, you know, it's it's not parts of ourselves or parts of what we have that we want to destroy. It's just maybe they belong somewhere else.、Mm-hmm. That is very artistic. View of secondary market. Wow. <laughs> well, you're the specialist, so、uh, I, maybe I just、way. made it up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think a, a theme that's come up in some of the previous interviews we've done is, what are the real tradeoffs and what are false tradeoffs? You know, some, sometimes it seems like, you know, we have to choose between A and B, and that could be in, you know, the opportunity cost of, of deploying capital. It could be in our politics and geopolitics of you know which which system are you with, and then there are times when those seem like false choices, when there is a third way when you know a for example a new technology can can break the false choice between quality and efficiency or you know quality and cost and, and we can actually have them both、mm. if we innovate our way there.、Mm. And maybe the same is true with with our politics. You know, maybe we we don't have to be either or. We can we can have the best of both worlds if we just get it together and you know think think of a new way forward that we weren't consider. It's kind of a creative act.、Mm. What does creativity and innovation look like in your sector?、Mm. I I I think、uh, we touched upon this、um, earlier. For example, how GPs would use secondary market is quite in an innovative way, and how the transaction is not just about the price, but is also about payment terms, also about perhaps you know if you can、uh, you can structure some kind of upside sharing. Right, that also is quite an innovative way, and、um, I think these are back to what we earlier said: is the false trade-off is where you don't make the pie bigger、mm. when it's possible. But of course, not in all situations it's possible. Sometimes the seller is only cares about the price, and if you can't meet his price expectation, there is no deal. Right? It's it's, it's simple. Um, but still, I think you just have to try. You just have to. In every every case, is of course is different. But you just have to try, and then you just have to nudge, and that is something that interesting for me as well because I am not a patient person. But sometimes the dynamic of the transaction just force you to wait. And in some cases, you wait, and a better result comes to you, right? I mean, I guess that's some element of luck there. Yeah. <laughs> Matt Levine at Bloomberg often writes about how his favorite, like, situation in finance is when the optimal move is to do nothing. Yeah. And there's like that happens sometimes where it's just like,、sure. you know, maybe you call it waiting, and maybe、yeah. it's just do nothing is the right move here. Yes, and that creates value. And th- there's like a nice sort of Zen, you know, Wu Wei、uh, feel to that. My impression is that there is a culture in the finance industry of let's put my strong opinions up front, and you know, we'll we'll hash it out. And if it comes to you know Ying Peng Ying, right? Like、yeah. someone will pull rank or. The market will decide. You know, we we agree to disagree, and we'll you know the market will <laughs> will figure it out. How, as you've been learning more about psychology and counseling and and meditation and these other practices, do you think there is a you know maybe this is one of those innovations that can lead to you know a, a, a new outcome? Like, is there a room in finance 
for these alternate approaches and what you know could it unlock a lot of deal value if just the way that we talk to each other and the way that we engage with one another were to evolve there are definitely some elements of culture differences whereas um you know if you talk to sorry i'm generalizing but if you are talking to americans they are more opinionated and they're you know they 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 would not hesitate to say what's on their mind whereas you know in the same room then the chinese will usually be quiet and i started my career in a european company and i learned that everybody is equal doesn't matter you are a managing director or you are an analyst everybody as long as you are on the same table you have the right to speak up i think the culture difference is hard to mitigate unless you are aware of it and then you are um, purposely uh, correcting your behavior so to speak uh, but but i think deeper down is everybody should learn how to listen i think ted once said in his podcast about this point and i i think you as a communication coach you probably know this better than any anybody else is your position going in is to listen and then talk rather than talk and then not listen and and then if everybody sort of have that mindset i think the the conversation will go much smoother for everybody you know there's a there's a first mover advantage right in in setting the tone and setting the narrative and pegging the price right in terms of price that's the anchor effect right that's uh, everybody use it in a daily negotiation do you want to be the first person to anchor the price or do you want to let the other person open the open the bid and yeah, so, respond to it right so, so this is more more from a technical perspective um usually i would do that um usually i would give a price first or i would provide term sheet um proactively so that um from a you know pure negotiation technical perspective i have a, a higher advantage point um but again i think once you go into the details of the negotiation the important things to do is still bear in mind that try to create values for both parties and try to make the pie bigger if that's possible and i do um you know value highly what uh, i think i think li kashin said is you always leave the money on the table so don't be that person that takes all the money all the benefits all the profits away from your components because then you can only be one time components you can never be partners and in our business which is a very long term in nature you want to have more partners than just one time opponents right anything you want to recommend to our listeners um for finding inner peace in a finance career i would recommend a book i just finished called wiser richer happier it's about uh interviewing 40 top investors most of these investors are public equity investors yeah i'd love to read that it sounds yeah. really cool either so i want to give a shout out to yeah. uh, morgan hustle's new book um uh -huh. same as ever uh, about what changes and what remains the same mm. in human nature and in markets I've, i've just started it and really enjoying it okay is it about is it a, a, a general economic book yeah so morgan house is a, a vc investor at the oh. collab fund it's uh he was the author of the psychology of money uh, which oh was really good. okay and okay so this is his new book it's right it's just published recently i've been yeah. really enjoying it finally any meditation practice for uh for staying cool in the middle of a deal when things are really hot um outside of you know our daily you know our, our daily practice what can you do in a negotiation in a high pressure situation to regain balance and control or find inner peace while it's all going on around you mm. 
the simplest thing to do is to take three deep breath during, you know, if you find yourself very angry or if you find yourself very frustrated or anything, just take deep breath. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's the e easiest thing to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But when you take a deep breath, um, I guess, of course, it, it's, it's sort of to relax you from a uh, physiology perspective. But also the mindset is that don't do anything on an on a impulse. Yeah, I, I think I am much better on that front nowadays, now that I'm, uh, you know, older, uh, hopefully also wiser. <laughs> Of controlling impulses. Yeah, correct. Yeah. You have any stories you can share on that? When I was quite frustrated or um, upset with 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 my my bottleneck or my plateau in my career path, I at a certain point of time I feel like I'm always angry. I was always angry and. So when I realized I was losing my temper very easily, I actually looked for books that teaches you how to control your anger. For a while, at least at a superficial level, that worked. And then I went to the Vipassana and then the meditation, and then I think it was a more a deeper level to understand where this anger came from. It's this magical thing. I remember there's a book... Uh, the Wizard of Earthsea. It was kind of a fantasy book. And mm. one of the ideas in it was that everything had a true name. And if you could find its true name, you could control it. And very much with our emotions, you know, they are these powerful things that are just constantly controlling us mm -hmm. until we name them. Mm -hmm. And then when we do, we get some control over them. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and we're released from, from their influence, yeah. uh, at least significantly, if not entirely. This is actually a really good exercise because um, when people are quite new to meditation, um, they can't even name those feelings. So there are, you know, there are always feelings within you, but people not necessarily able to name this specific feeling or emotion. And if they can't do that, then they don't know what's happening to them, and then the next thing they do cannot solve that problem. Yeah, so that's actually a good exercise to start with. Yeah, I think financial literacy and emotional literacy should be integrated, more integrated as curricula. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, we've, we've worked with managers that don't have a vocabulary for their feelings. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are really incredibly yeah. smart, yeah. really accomplished, yeah. you know, very, very... Yeah. So actually, uh, this is something that I also want to touch upon is uh, being rational and being emotional. Uh, but I want to check with you first. Is emotional an active word? If you ask me, it's not. But it probably has a negative connotation in the, in the finance industry more broadly. If you went into a Wall Street bank and said, you know, I rely on my emotions to make decisions, you probably would get fired. <laughs> okay, what, what is a more neutral or positive way to say emotional versus rational? Maybe intuitive. Mm. Like, I, I think there's sort of a respect for, like, the gut. The gut, yes. And, the, and you know, the intuition. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know. It's pretty tough to beat rationality in terms of kind of respect in the, you know, in finance. Uh, although I think a lot of, pe you know, there's in, not just people, but like a lot of scientific research to suggest that, you know, our rationality is one form of knowledge, but there's, there's other forms of knowledge as well. W what do you think? I mean, is, is emotion a bad word? I wasn't thinking that way until someone remind me of that so which i was surprised to find out that emotional like you said has a little bit negative connotation but uh, what i wanted to say is i think in my early years of my career i always thought i'm a very rational person 
And because I like to look at numbers because all my work deal with numbers, right? I like to look at numbers and make decisions based on numbers and facts. And that's why some people think I'm actually quite a cold person in that sense. I think ever since my exercise with meditation and psychological counseling practices, I feel emotion is so important to be a part of your life, including your part of your, your work. And I'm, so in that sense, I'm not saying make a decision based on emotion, but I think if you can pre-tell your emotion, you could avoid many potential mistakes. And if you could use your emotion, probably it could be very powerful in terms of co communicating with others, negotiating with others, and that kind of stuff, right? And I, uh, recently I was revisiting a book that uh, I read a couple of years ago called, uh, so it's something about female leadership. There were statistics evidence saying that female leaders are way more effective than male leaders. I'm not so sure if female does have more emotions than male, but female does express their emotions easily, more easily than their male uh, uh, correspondents. So in that sense, you can, you can say that emotion could be a powerful tool if you know how to use it, rather than just using the numbers and the facts. Yeah, I think instead of talking about it as rationality versus emotion, it might be more helpful to say, how do we rationally use or rationally address our emotions? I mean, mm -hmm. the emotions are a fact. We all have them as logical or as numbers oriented as you may be. And then the question is just, okay, so what are we going to do with them? Are we going to ignore them and pretend like they are not having an influence mm -hmm. on us? That is actually irrational. It is rational to say, I'm an emotional human being and I want to first understand, name, harness those emotions to be productive towards my rational goals. Um, and I think that's a, a skill set that we're not really trained no. to do. No. And in that sense, is like an inefficiency in individuals, in institutions, in the industry that represents, if we want to talk about like innovations that can create value, I, I think there's a ton of relatively low hanging fruit, right? Like we're not talking about building rocket ships or something. We're just helping people get a fuller understanding of themselves and therefore of the situation of mm -hmm. the, of the economic situation that they're in. Yeah. Um, and getting that understanding and control, you know, could unlock a lot of value across the industry. Yeah. So maybe, uh, maybe as you know, in the future, GP accelerator or, yeah. uh, you know, manager training that we do, we should add some, you know, mindfulness and MBSR and uh, meditation practice. Yeah, I, I think the crossover between investment and psychology is definitely a topic that I want to continue to study and perhaps write something about it. Love it. Yeah, love it. Well, looking forward to it. And let's let's keep that conversation going. Uh, right. I think it's yeah. something that that I myself and most of the other managers that you know have been on the podcast are really interested in, um, and a, a really exciting direction for our conversations and our work. Thanks, Nicole, for being on the podcast. Welcome. I'm uh, very happy to be on the podcast. Thank Yay. you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. See you soon. Thanks for listening. To support, please check out the links to our sponsors in the show notes. Follow me on LinkedIn. And of course, subscribe to The Essence of Investing wherever you get your podcasts. With that, I'm signing off. Your happy and humble host, Jonathan Reckman. See you next time.